Why is the Russian army leaving the Kherson region and displacing tens of thousands of Ukrainians? Why are missiles killing civilians? Which is stronger in the power struggle inside Kreml, super strong National Guard loyal to Putin or Russian army? How high is the risk for sabotage with the Russian-owned the real properties in Finland? These and other burning questions air answered today in IASTV Ukraine studio. Broadcasted this time in University of Jibwe-Skileagora building. Hence, we are now in the home field of our expert guest Marty J. Kari. Where he is professor of practice in security and strategic analysis master's program since August 2022. Congratulations for the professorship. Thank you. And thank you in advance for this interview. And thank you for coming. You can find the details of this live broadcast later today on the ISFI website. You can go and have a look if you have to postpone the watching now. We air here for about 45 minutes. Let's first take a look at the recent news from the Ukrainian war, which shows that the progress of the Ukrainian attacks has slowed down. Some have already been concerned about this. Marty J. Kari, what conclusions from the current attack can be drawn from the war success of the near future? Do you have anything to add? Well, it is not really worth worrying about because the operational security of the Ukrainian operation is at its peak. The Ukrainians don't tell what they are redoing. If you think about it in the direction of Kharkov, the attack is progressing. The attack is progressing in the bomb area. The Russians are trying with counterattacks, but the Ukrainians continue to push the Russians further east. And now the Russians are already 20 kilometers away from the battle in the Hursk area. The Hursk area, which means that the Russians are counting on the attack to go at least that far. And the Russians imagine that they can stop the Ukrainians in the Hursk area and in the Donets River region. But in any case, the Ukrainian attack in the direction of Kharkov is progressing slowly, but surely. It's clear that the tempo of the attack is changing. The troops are wearing out. The troops are being rotated. The troops are being maintained. The firepower is running out. The fuel is running out. But in any case, Ukraine pushes the aggressor away from its own territory in the direction of Kharkov. If we go to the Kherson area, the attack is also progressing in the Kherson area. The Ukrainians have managed to push the Russians quite well both from the direction of Mikolaev and from the Dnipro River to Kherson. And then the good thing is that in the Kherson area, the Ukrainian air forces have pounded the Russian air defense quite well. So all in all, the attack is progressing. So there is no need to worry, it is progressing. An interesting piece of information was when the Russian high-ranking war leader, General Surovikin, told in advance about the great problems of his army in the area of Kherson, as he had familiarized himself with the situation. Is this general's opening somehow surprising, or was it a carefully considered action for a certain reason? It was probably carefully considered. In the direction of Kherson, something surprising can happen. It can be that Shirovikin is preparing something surprising in the direction of Kherson, or that he is somehow securing his own back of it, that if it goes wrong, having spoken about this end is thus preparing people. Could it be that he would also prepare for a major defeat in the Kherson area? Yes, with his own leaders and the home front, for losing the Kherson. As Surovikin commented, at least in the West, it was interpreted almost like a withdrawal announcement. How likely do you think that the Russian troops will have to withdraw to the east side of the Dnepr River? It seems that before Christmas, if nothing strange happens, the western bank of the Dnipro River, that is, the right bank, will be purged from the Russians. What would be the significance for the Ukrainian army if the Russians had to retreat completely? It would be important. For example, then they would save Odessa. Then the attack on Odessa would. And this would be an important thing for whole of Ukraine, saving Odessa. Yes, because Ukraine does not live without export, and Odessa 
is the most important harbor now that the Sea of Azov is no longer in use. Odessa is the most important harbor and Ukraine does not live without exports. So it is financially, politically, and mentally extremely important that Odessa is protected. Even though there is still the Mykolaiv region, Bukherson is closed protecting the direction of Odessa. And also the fact that Kherson is the capital of Kherson Oblast. And if the Russians have annexed Kherson as an imaginary republic and now Ukraine gets the capital of Kherson Oblast for itself, it is then like a middle finger for the Russians. Yes, it is a middle finger and it is not a one horse town of Kherson. No, it is not. I have been there. It is a great city, a big city, many hundreds of thousands of people. Yes, it is. Okay, about the middle finger. What would be the psychological significance for the Russians when they think that they have just annexed this in their mind? Of course, the Russians would be angry and take it to heart, but it would not crush the Russian psyche, but it would be vexing. Would it be Russia's biggest defeat in this war until now? Yes. I would say that the biggest defeat would be Kiev and the second biggest defeat would be the Mati encirclement fighting in Izumand in the area there. But yes, this would be a big defeat. Still, autumn is coming, the weather is getting worse. You have been in Ukraine. How long can there be so-called land battles there? About a month, and the fields would be in such a state that they would not be able to spread troops, heavy equipment, tanks, combat vehicles, and so on, before we get to the beginning of March, when the drought season will begin again. And then there will be a lot going on again. Yes, definitely. I have to take the opportunity to talk about the fact that the news from the West and then President Zelensky announced that Russia would continue the preparation of explosives in Kakovkan Reservoir and Hydropower Plant, specifically in the area of Kherson. You know that area. Tell me what tactical wisdom would be for the Russians here that they would detonate some explosives there. Well, they exploded during World War II, when they tried to prevent the Germans from advancing. They exploded dams in the Dnieper River, among other things. Now, if they could explode the Nova Kakavka Dam, they would lose the ability to get water to the northern Krim. From the Nova Kakavka Dam starts the irrigation channel of the North Krim, from where the Krim gets irrigation water. That would be a negative thing. A positive thing would be that they could somehow form a huge natural barrier between the attacking Ukrainians and the defending Russians. Because now in that area, in the area of Kherson, the Dnieper is about a kilometer wide. If they would explode it in the valley, then in a few hours, in a couple of hours, the surface of the water would rise by about five meters. There is twice. In the Nova Kakovgar Reservoir, there is twice as much water as in the Lake Page Ain. So if they would explode it, it would mean that in two hours the water would rise in the area of Kherson by about five meters. It would mean that the one kilometer of the Dnieper would be about five kilometers wide, and the water mass would stay there for about three days. The water flow would be quite fast, 24 kilometers per hour or 15 miles per hour would be the water flow speed, which would also, in a way, sweep away buildings, weapon systems, people. So all in all, that water could be used as a weapon and as a barrier. Yes, yes, and if it came as a surprise to the Ukrainian army, it would be quite a disaster. Yes. If the Ukrainians would go to the riverbank, to the area of Kherson, and then the dam would start and the water would flow, then it would kill. Is it possible that after this possible explosion, it would be questionable and left in the dark who was behind the explosion? Well, no, because there is no reason for the Ukrainian army to explode the dam. No one else but the Russians. Even if they do not admit it, it would be a clear. No, but it still belongs to the Russian narrative of truth and falsehood, that they are not telling anything. So it does not matter. No, the Russians do not, of course, want to leave their army under the cover of the dam, but they would explode it after withdrawing. Yes, that's why they pull troops out of Kherson at the moment. That's why they evacuated the population from Kherson at the moment, because they still don't want to drown the local population. Yes. But let's take it again. What does this strategy tell about the fact that only a couple of weeks ago the Russians joined Kherson? And now they would crush the dam there. Well, 
It just tells that the Russians have fewer cards available. Ukraine has the operative upper hand took this and Russia is a little weaker all the time. Now they have to react to opponent's behavior. So we can say that let's use water as a mass destruction weapon. Yes, that's quite something. Let's move on to the martial law situation. They have been talked about a lot lately, you have also commented on them, but I'll ask again. Vladimir Putin raised a lot of abros by announcing martial law in the occupied territories a couple of weeks ago. You have made your PhD on the strategic security of Russia. What are the most important goals and significance of martial laws in Russia? The Russians always do everything according to the law, that is according to their own laws and their interpretation of the laws. In a way, they always seek their own legislation for authorization of their own actions. And now that these areas are connected to Russia, they can be declared a war zone, which means that they have a completely different grip to the local population than before. In principle, they can. The war zone law gives the possibility to force migration of the population. It gives the possibility to arrest people for 30 days without any grounds. It gives the possibility to confiscate. For example, in this case, you can confiscate cell phones and everything the Ukrainians could use to inform their own that the Russians are doing this and that. It gives the possibility to declare curfews. Because McGuis is that in the Kherson area, the Ukrainian resistance is quite strong at the moment. Local troops are operating there, special forces are operating there. And Mao Zedong would teach in the old days that the partisans are like fish in the water. And if you want to kill the fish, you have to destroy the water. Local people are the water and the partisans are the fish. If you want to destroy the fish, you have to take on the water. It would mean that the people are forced to migrate. There are external migration bans, there are raids, people are arrested, and so on. So, they treat to fight the resistance. In particular, it is now important because a larger part of Russian logistics goes through the land connection because that bridge, bridge has been destroyed. And the land connection is easier to operate for partisans. And when the logistics goes through the land connection, the partisans will probably work against the logistics. At the moment, the Russians are also quite in trouble with the partisans. Still on what you just said, does this mean that we are talking about Ukrainians? But now the Russians, after the martial law and after the annexation, treat these Ukrainians as Russian citizens. Yes, for the Russian people, they are Russian citizens because they wanted to join the Russians. They are Russians according to the Russian law. So the Russian military, the Russian army, the Russian militia have relatively free hands there. Yes, and there are probably National Guard troops moved to the area to keep them in their place. Then a word about the evacuations according to the Russians. In the West, we talk about forced migration. What kind of terror or war crime do you see happening here? The forced migration of people is a war crime. You have talked about Saldo, who is the Russian boss of Thakerson. There are several tens of thousands of Hersonians who are being moved somewhere. Yes, they are being moved from the eastern part of the Dnieper River to the Russian side, at least part of them. You have also mentioned that the partisan activities have accelerated and the Russians are in trouble because of it. What do you mean when you say it accelerated? It means that there is a strike against the logistic. Russian-minded government leaders are killed there. There is a lot of reconnaissance and preparation. The Ukrainian special forces are being supported. Local armed forces, the partisans, are making it possible for the special forces to come there. Their strikes and so on. All in all, it is the duty of the local forces to slow down, inform and disturb. That is what is being actively done there.
I have a question about this. Why did Putin order the martial law just now? You have already answered it. Yes. There are a lot of things that are important for Putin. Now that they are a part of Russia, they can declare the martial law. On the other hand, something special will happen in the Kherson area soon. Does the declaration of the martial law in the Kherson area predict that Russia will declare in the whole Russia in the near future? No, because Russia is talking about the Federation subjects, the autonomous areas and so on, the different administrative areas. A certain administrative area can be declared a state of emergency if there is a forest fire, or a martial law if an area is attacked or harbors are blockaded. This does not mean anything for the whole picture, but just for the four areas. Let's go to the other side of Ukraine, to the northern border. It has been interesting to follow the attacks, quite destructive attacks, in Belgorod, which caused quite a fuss in Russia. Belgorod is a big city on the northern border, but in the old country of Russia. Marty J. Curry, Ukraine has not admitted to the attacks, but what do you think? Is it a series of coincidences or an attack by the Ukrainian army? An attack by the Ukrainian army. We have to remember that this is not the old country of Russia and the new country of Russia. It is only the country of Russia. The four Mickey Mouse republics or imaginary republics are the same way part of Russia as Belgorod in the thoughts of the Russians. You can't think that the person area can be attacked, but Belgorod not. The Ukrainians also attacked Moscow. They tried to attack Dujin, but got his daughter only. The Ukrainians do these things quite skillfully. So you think, because the Russians have been shocked by the arrogance that the Ukrainians have shown. Because they have attacked the Russian side, but you think that the Ukrainian army has the right to attack there. Of course. The Russians have no reason to be shocked when you think about what all the Russians are doing. They burn, kill, rape, steal. If the Ukrainians attack the military areas of Belgorod, the Russians have no reason to attack them. Yes, Belgorod is an important railway and traffic junction. It is the center of fire for military supplies and fuel. Soldiers are trained there. Southbound soldiers are sheltered. It is wise to attack there. Yes. Is it so that it is in the reach of artillery? That it has been attacked with artillery allegedly? Yes, it is close to the Ukrainian border. Can the strikes in Belgorod, which have been carried out within the last two weeks, be interpreted as a counterattack by Ukraine? Because the Russians have increased the number of fire and attacks against civilians. Yes, it is. It has an operational goal as well as a psychological goal. Because is there any kind of revenge phase on the part of the Russia? I do not know. Now we are allowed to understand that this is a revenge and a revenge and a revenge. But those strikes should usually have an operational goal. When we think about what the Russians are doing, they try to cut the moral and the backbone by hitting their electricity and heat. So the Ukrainians also attack operational targets in Belgorod. But of course, it is also a mental thing that they can attack Russia. Does it cause racing hearts, unis, and anger in Russia? I do not think so. No. The Russians can endure quite a lot. But is the people being agitated? Yes, the Russian propaganda is pounding. How does the Russian propaganda exploits this? Well, they do say that kindergartens were attacked and so on. But the Russians do know how to read between lines. They understand what is going on here. It is true that it does not give too much credit. The Russians read between the lines smoothly. Yes, they have always read. During the Tsarist Imperial Russia even, for example, they probably did know how to read between the lines even before they could read. And during the Soviet era, they developed as masters to read between the lines. It is quite relieving to know, when you look at the shocking news programs, that the people read between the lines. Yes, quite a lot. If they now know that the so-called Mobilnik, that is, 
The regular mobilized fellow has a lifetime of 12 days. From when he gets the papers in his hand, it is 12 days when he comes back in the coffin. Then they know that the thing does not work out well over there. But still, the Russian president Vladimir Putin has tried to limit the effects of the war very carefully to the outside of Russia. But in Belgorod, the sounds of the explosion. They have come during working days. The New York Times wrote in the report that the feeling in Belgorod is paranoid. Suddenly you have to be afraid for your life. Yes, but in Russia, the atmosphere has always been paranoid. It is always state terror, violence, there is nothing strange about it. It's like the new world for the New York Times. Yes. Someone said that during World War II it was wonderful when the door was knocked and someone just came to tell that your boy had fallen down. It was not NKVD. The paranoia is so deep in the structures of the culture. Yes. But does this information still spread throughout Russia? Probably. Official information? No. The official information is that the Ukrainian terrorists attacked Belgorod and destroyed some children's kindergarten or something. But in Russia, as I have said, there are many truths. There is the official truth, the street truth and the kitchen truth. The story spreads in the kitchen truth. The neighbor Vanja was drafted and came back after 12 days in a coffin. So the whole block knows quickly. Sure knows. He did not get any training. He got an old weapon that did not work. Or he was taken as a prisoner. Yes. Calls her mother at home. Her mother said, hey, Vanja was taken prisoner, and all is good there. Let's move on to a more serious matter. To the Russian missile strikes. According to the Ukrainian Rescue Agency, Russia has carried out nearly 200 missile strikes in the last two weeks on the Ukrainian side, also using drones. About 100 people have died in them. What do you think are the motives for Putin and the Russian war leadership sending a huge number of missiles and drones to civilians? And not to military targets? Well, that means that the Russians have studied the Persian Gulf War 1991 operation in the way that Colonel Warden made a plan where the idea was to form a layer of circles. The inner circle is the leader. After that there is infrastructure, population and armed forces. We try to influence all those circles. We can influence them in such a way that they speak off the center of gravity. That is, the center of force is the leadership. So we try to influence the Ukrainian leadership. And when we can't influence it, we influence the circles. The closer to the inner circle and the leader, we can influence it better. And now we try to influence the infrastructure, because it also affects the combat endurance of the population and so on. So this is a normal model for air operations, how it is done. According to some estimates, these missiles are a revenge for the explosion of the Kerch Bridge more than two weeks ago. According to some, the motivation is the defense of Russia and Putin's honor, which has suffered quite a lot. Yes, I suspect that Shurovikin has studied or his staff has studied the Persian Gulf War and is now thinking about air operations. I suspect that the structure of this operation is changing. We are going to break the Ukrainian moral and combat endurance. The ability to fight in such a way that we try to hit the thermal power plants. Now that winter is coming, we try to influence the center of gravity. That is the influence on the leadership. I don't really believe in these revenge things. They are probably great things. But big armed forces cannot act like that. Though sometimes sure. When the Germans bombed London during the Battle of England, the British put bombers on Berlin just to show that we can do this. Or when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. That the United States attacked Tokyo. They drove a support vehicle close to Tokyo. And Tube 52 bombed Tokyo. Sometimes there are these revenge things, but I don't think that the revenge is the main motive here. But they have changed the frame of the operation. Now we are trying to influence the leadership by breaking the Ukrainian will to fight.
It has been talked about Russia's small missile reserves, but they have still kind of wasted the powder toe the civilian attacks. It has been mentioned many times that, for example, in World War II, the terrible bombings of the Allies on German cities were not that beneficial for the warfare. Has Russia forgotten this, or are they looking for Syria and Chechnya? I have seen how they attack, but they are trying to attack some targets that really have some operational significance. But when they are so inaccurate that they hit all over the place, so they will hit the civilian homes and so on. But mainly they are trying to hit operational targets. What I know about the Ukrainians is that they have never given up. They have never given up, and the Russians know it. It is a waste of time to try to bomb the people, because they will not surrender. They have been Russian slaves for so long, that if we surrender as Russian slaves once more, we will never become free. They know it. It is a complete waste to bomb them. These missiles have been inaccurate, and there will be civilian casualties. Does Russia care about civilian casualties? And if and when, what does it mean for Russian culture? Russia does not care about civilian casualties. Typically during a war, civilian casualties are not cared about. Let us think about what the British did in Dresden. A huge number of Germans died in Dresden. What did the U.S. do in Hiroshima? Atomic bombs? A huge number of Japanese died. It is a bit hypocritical to say that they try to avoid civilian casualties. They do not care about civilian casualties. One last question on this. The possible floating of the dam. The forced migration of Ukrainians and bombing civilians and the destruction of energy sources. They are distinctive elements of war crimes. Yes. What do the Russians think about it? Oh damn, we did war crimes. They do not think about it, because they think that they will never be responsible. In any case, they will not extradite people to the Hague, or if an international criminal tribunal is set up in Ukraine, as it was done in Yugoslavia, the Russians will never extradite. Whatever happens to the Russians politically, even if the government changes, they will never extradite to their own Hague, or to the Ukrainian war crime tribunal. They do not care. Interesting. We still have a lot of time left. I will take an interesting article in which you wrote an opinion piece to Kiskisumalain in newspaper. I hope you will explain this for us as well. You wrote that the Russians have internal tensions between the two powers, the armed forces and the guard. The tensions have risen, as has happened before, when in the government everything is not as good as before. I am interested in this huge National Guard of the Interior Ministry. Does Putin have a private army? Or what is the most important task of this guard? It is a private army. Van the Terrible. Let's go a long way back in history. Van the Terrible founded the Opportunik system which means that in this system, he had the borders and the people in grip. If the people made trouble, the Opportunina would go there and paralyze the unrest. The borders were kept under a firm hand. If it was suspected that the borders were planning a cup against the government, so this part of the borders was killed. The estates were burned and so on. During the time of Ivan the Terrible, a state terror was born in the Russian strategic culture. What has been then continued? Chika, Lenin and Zershinsky founded the Cheka at that time. Then came NKVD, KGB, and now there is FSB, SVR, the National Guard. So the Russia has this state terror idea that the leader can use violence against the people and against the Bojers. If it is for the benefit of the Tsar and the country, the situation is that when Stalin died, Khrushchev and Beria fought for power. Beria had NKVD behind him, that is, the Ministry of Interior was behind him, which included both police forces and intelligence. And Khrushchev got the armed forces. 
Zhukov. Zhukov came to side of Khrushchev. And they measured who was who. The situation was that the armed forces won. NKVD was not so strong then. It was strong, but the armed forces were still stronger. Beria was shot, and NKVD was split up. NKVD was split into parts. It became KGB, or the predecessor of KGB, the MU, and then the MVD, Ministry of Interior. It was split up into parts. Intelligence and internal security were separated into parts, because it was too strong, so that it could no longer form a force that could seize the power there. Little by little, as the situation went on, KGB grew, grew, grew. And after that, when there was a standoff in 1991, the armed forces, KGB was a bit on the sidelines. And the armed forces were partly on the sidelines, but partly went behind Jeltsin. I remember when the airborne troops went to protect Jeltsin. And now, when Putin realizes that he cannot trust the armed forces completely, because there are still quite a lot of conscripts who are the people's children. And if you tell your people's children to shoot their mothers, they will not necessarily shoot them. So in a way, between the armed forces and between Putin, a new force, the Oprichnik system, whose name is the National Guard, was founded in 2016 from the troops of the Ministry of Interior. So it is quite fresh. Yes, quite fresh. They have been, the troops have been, the Omen and Sober and then the troops of the Ministry of Interior, and so on. They have always been together. One package was created out of them. 340,000 men. A huge number. Yes, an incredible number. And then they were given under the leadership of Viktor Zolotov, who was previously the Deputy Minister of Interior, who then rose to the leadership of the National Guard, who is Putin's complete trustee. So now Putin has this in his disposal. And then it was organized under the Security Council. So there is nothing, no ministries in between. But it is a direct subordinate to the Security Council. A direct subordinate to the Security Council of Russia. That is, this group is a direct subordinate to Putin. You mentioned Viktor Zolotov. I cheated using Wikipedia. He is, surprise, surprise, Putin's judo buddy. Yes, he is a judo buddy. Tell us a little bit about him and his loyalty. Well, he is a bodyguard. He was the bodyguard of Sobchak then, during Leningrad, during Leningrad, during St. Petersburg time. And they became friends at the judo gym. And Putin has taken him into the environment of Sobchak, and he has been the bodyguard of Sobchak. And after that, he brought Zolotov to Moscow, when Putin went to Moscow. And he is one of these bogers, who has received everything from Putin. He has a 10 million housing ownership, 20 million euro estates and so on. He has received all from Putin. He belongs to the Bogers who would lose everything if Putin fell. And namely when his children have a 5 million housing in the center of Moscow. So the whole card stack would fall if Putin would lose his power. Which would mean that Zolotov would keep Putin's side until the end. Is the trust on both sides? It has been so far. Putin has no doubt that Zolotov. And Zolotov has a KGB background. So the main part of the Leningrad 70s KGB guys, they are just the Bortnikov, Narishkin, Petrushev. They are the very trusted people of Putin. Ivanov was the only one who was put aside. Ivanov is now taking care of the environmental issues. But mainly the inner, inner, inner circle is from the 70s KGB from Leningrad. This Zolotov does not seem like a philosopher. What kind of personality does he have? Well, he. For example, Navalny challenged him to a television debate. Zolotov's answer was that, yes, we will meet on the tatami or in the ring and it will make you into minced meat. Their ideas move a little bit on a different level with Navalny. Yes, I would imagine. You mentioned in your Keskisumalainen opinion piece that this Kurt Bridge attack happened like under National Guards and Zolotov's watch. Yes. The Guards task is counterterrorism and protecting the rear, counterterrorism, maintaining public order and safety and so on. 
So out of these 350,000 men, some are behind the front line. Last week, one of the National Guard Colonel Fell, who is probably the commander of our brigade. He fell there in the direction of Herson. So they are coming there. After the army attack, just like the NKVD troops came after the attacking Red Army, which began to clean up the area, to see who there are suspicious people, who are terrorists and who are counter-revolutionaries. So they clean up the rear all the time and keep an eye on the rear. And as you mentioned, it's Putin's tool to carry out state terrorism. So it is these guard people who are carrying out state terrorism against Ukrainians, who have suddenly forced into Russians in Kherson. Yes, yes, sure. The armed forces, in a way, look in the direction of the enemy and out. The National Guard looks inside. What's going on behind the front line? Then there's the interesting fact that the guard is that big, a great power. And the Russian has an extreme shortage of soldiers in the front line. So are there any of these? If there are a number of troops behind the lines, are there somewhere in the Moscow region or somewhere in the interior a lot of guard soldiers? There were. In the Moscow region there is Obzershinsky division, whose task is to keep Moscow calm. And in every federation, which there were eight of, there are at least one brigade National Guard troops. And their task is to make sure that the big cities in the area remain calm, no matter what happens. And even if the soldiers are missing from the front lines galore, they do not dare to send top-class soldiers to the front lines. Because their task is not the task of the armed forces. Their task is different from the task of the armed forces. Their task is counterterrorism general order and security and so on. Their tasks are different. Is it important for them to be there? They're in Mother Russia to keep people under control, so that there are no demonstrations. Yes. Is that their main task? You did mention the protection of Moscow. What does that mean? If unrest starts in Moscow, that Zershinsky division takes immediate control. They will probably immediately protect all the government buildings, ensure the security of the public order and so on. They have a law which gives the option to shoot at the protesters. When the National Guard was founded, there was also a law established in Russia gives the National Guard the option to shoot at unarmed protesters, including in the case that they threatened the governmental structures. It was a bit of a strange law, because it says separately that women who are pregnant cannot be shot, because it is, of course, humane. The Tsar is humane. And the whole country is terribly humane. One last question about this guard. It takes care that the people do not rise to the barricades. And we have been wondering many times how come the people do not demonstrate. But does that mean that they would be shot? I don't think they would be shot. But there would be a lot of roughing up and clubbing, as we have seen. So they are quite rough with demonstrators using clubs, arresting and so on. But when you look at it now, there is tension between the National Guard and the intelligence services. There is tension. Because in March, when it became clear that the FSB had not bribed all the authorities that it had claimed to have bribed in Ukraine, the chief of the 5th Directorate was arrested. And the FSB's counterattack was that they arrested the assistant director of the National Guard and accused him of corruption. Everyone in Russia can be arrested of corruption. Everyone does it. Compared to us, it is like talking to a mobile phone. Everyone in Russia practices corruption. Everyone can be accused of corruption and arrested for it if they want to. They arrested the assistant director of the National Guard as a revenge because the FSB's fifth directorate's chief was arrested. Plus, because the performance of the National Guard in March in the Kharkov and Kiev area was terrible. They are fighting. How strong is the National Guard within the Kremlin's pecking order? It is quite strong. Now they raised the Zolotov. Zolotov did not belong to the core group. He participated in the video conference the other day. The Zolotov was there. The Gerasimov, the army, was there. The army and the National Guard were raised closer to the Tsar. How right is it to draw the conclusion that Putin's position is pretty strong? It is strong. Putin is constantly trying to figure out where some kind of opposition could be born 
opposition of Bojers. How to break it? One more point about Putin. He was seen with soldiers for a long time when he was watching trained troops on the field. He himself shot with a rifle, lying down. What message did he convey? He is a wartime leader. He is like a wartime leader and noticed that he has to be with the troops. It was Zvezda. It was a military channel where it came out. He showed that he is with them and interested in it. In reality, he seemed very scared. I even heard that a soldier was shot there. He approached Putin too aggressively. I do not know if it is true or not. I conquered. I watched the short video. He was not really at home there. No, he was in a winter trench coat. He seemed very awkward and wanted to be somewhere else clearly. Compared to his counterpart Zelensky, who is in green togs and is one of the men, there is a big difference in the fact that Zelensky is present every day electrically and often in hospitals. Putin has had to take a long break from this. Is it in the air now that Putin has to be more present? He has to be present, particularly the failure of the mobilization. And then there is also the fact that the armed forces need to show the Tsar that everything is going fine. This is Pokazua. The Russians pretend things. They call this Pokazua. We have these great equipment. There are sleeping bags. There are weapons and so on. And Putin pretends to be satisfied. Yes, there was a soldier's gear on the ground that apparently has not been generally delivered. When you mentioned the mobilization, the question is that according to Putin, the partial mobilization would end next week. What was your short assessment of the whole mobilization operation? It did not go as it should like in Stromso. It was quite moving. They got really bad material in. They got the wrong material in. They did not get the material they wanted in. They have to drive down the mobilization because they are starting to take in the conscripts in the fall. A little on the bigger picture that Putin's fears on mobilization have caused a lot of damage to Russia. They all have been realized in order. He held it back. We have seen masses of people on the borders leaving the country. There have been protests over forced mobilization, especially in remote republics. The president of Tajikistan directly complains to Putin for many minutes for his pain, judging Putin. Mm. Is Putin's card house in the risk of collapse? It does not collapse yet. Of course, he is under mixed pressures all the time. The mobilization always has its price. The mobilization's publicity and its reality always costs a lot of money. Even though in Russia the money, the 70s KGB group is not made of businessmen. They do not think everything through the economics, but in any case they realize that the mobilization costs a lot of money. When men are taken from the peacetime occupation and put into the armed forces, so he tried to keep the mobilization back until the last minute. Presumably the pressure was so high from some direction, so he had to announce it. And it disguised as a partial mobilization. Yes, the high price. Lately it has been reported that the moral in Moscow and St. Petersburg has changed to more anxious because the war finally affected their families, their fathers, their mothers and children. Is there something bubbling underneath? There is bubbling, sure, because we have a social contract in Finland. We have leaders who provided us with security and well-being. If it is not possible, we change them. We change our leaders in four years or keep them the same, typically in parliamentary elections, if we get security and well-being from them. In Russia, the social contract works so that there are the Bojers, the elites and the people. The elites steal the people's money as much as they can. The people treat to live 
and neither of them is bothering the life of the other. The elites lets the people live. The people are needed for production and cannon fodder. And the elites live their own life. Now it happens that in the two biggest cities, St. Petersburg and Moscow, the social contract is starting shake, because now the elites begins to deprive the people of their life. They started to make cannon fodder out of the regular people. And then the social contract starts to shake. The social contract begins to shake because the sanctions are biting in. The sanctions are biting the elite. The boaters cannot continue to steal the previous amounts that one is eligible due to one's position, because one cannot transfer the money to the West due to the sanctions are biting in. The Russian social contract is now in a turning point, and it can affect Putin's position. But it takes more time. If and when Russia, hopefully, experiences defeat, it will have a final effect on the social contract. And then something can happen. Like in 1917, when the soldiers voted with their feet, and the National Guard at the time refused to shoot the protesters. Something can happen then. Yes, so there is bubbling underneath. Bubbling for sure. Let's see how that develops. Let's move on to another topic. Recently, we have been concerned about Russians getting properties in Finland. Is it possible for Russia to use its citizens' properties to prepare for sabotage and attacks? <laughs> Let's think about the significance of Finland in the plans of the Russian Western Military District. We are a border country. We are a border country of the Western Military District. It is certain that operations are planned in the direction of Finland. It means that part of the operations will be the use of special forces. Let's think about the use of the special forces. What does it mean? It means that we need reconnoiter. Okay. Support, attack and so on. Okay, how do we do that? We need something which we can depend on already during the peace time. Places we can deploy during the peace time. From there, to reconnoiter places, prepare things and so on. I'd consider it not impossible at all that the Russian Special Forces Operation Plan includes Boeing areas, houses, estates and so on. Where they can depend on and operate during the peace time. So it is likely that the Russian operation plan includes. It is possible. 50%. As it is defined, likely 75%. Possible 50%. This is possible. Have we prepared for this in Finland? Yes. I think so. More and more. It's in the discourse. We have two intelligence services which are probably working with all their strength against this, both military and civilian intelligence. Have we been to Steri aid in Finland in the past? Maybe we have been. At the time when we thought that Russia would become a normal country and the Russians would buy these areas. At that time the money was probably more important than the need for operational security. The second question is the same. In Norway, drone pilots have been caught for flying close to strategic facilities, energy sources, and infrastructure. Is this possible, or likely in Finland too, that Russian cyber operators film different places? I would wonder if they don't film. We have certain areas that cannot be filmed. We have nuclear power plants, oil refineries, harbors and so on. We have prohibited and restricted areas where use of drones is limited or subject to permit. In practice, 250 grams of drone or more has to be registered. But it is quite difficult to monitor, because you can fly the drone. Before someone can say who is flying it, the drone can be lost. It should not be impossible that here in Finland too, drones are used. Should the people somehow improve their vigilance? Well, I don't know. The public security is a double-barreled thing. When vigilance gets out of hand, there will be a lot of incorrect reporting. It will be like it notable, yes. I think a healthy attitude is the best. In Finland, 
them. We are rather down to earth. I don't think we should not get really vigilant. I have already exceeded my time with a few minutes, but I would like to ask one more question. It is about nuclear weapons. Let's take a look at the background. You have compared Putin's threat with nuclear weapons and the situation in the Cuban crisis in 1961. At that time, the chairman of the Soviet Union, Khrushchev, had taken nuclear weapons to Cuba and threatened the United States with them. The United States had taken its own nuclear weapons to Turkey. The Cuban crisis was about to end in a nuclear war. Is the situation in the world now as bad? I don't think so. The United States knows that Putin's nuclear blackmail is a nuclear blackmail, and the Americans will not go along with it. Khrushchev also made the mistake. He said to his assistant, and put a glass full of water. He said that the outnumbered one must put the glass full of water. The one who adds more water to the glass will be responsible if the water goes to the table. Kennedy added water into the glass. What did Khrushchev say? He did not realize that Kennedy is such a strong leader, and he pulled the missiles from Cuba. So Kennedy called cards. Yes, because Kennedy had good intelligence. Kennedy knew the actual number of the missiles. Kennedy really knew their type and Kennedy knew the actual Soviet Union nuclear capacity at that time. So the West had a mole. Yes, but not a mole. It was an intelligence agent. Colonel Pankovsky worked for the GRU. The colonel first served ME6 and then the Americans. It was a normal human operation. It gave valuable information that Kennedy would dare to act. Kennedy saw Khrushchev's last concealed card. Is there a hope that the West has now an agent? Probably. They could tell already in January that Russia would attack. The U.S. intelligence has had a lot of information that was correct in this operation. The U.S. is good in this. And the British. Good. Thank you again for your time and expert commenting. Professor of Practice Marty J. Carey. Thank you.